One of the things that I always have done and always still do is if I play a show anywhere, I always um, tell the audience that I'm, you know, if you want to come to the merch table after the show, I sometimes spend an hour at the merch table shaking hands and signing autographs for people, signing t-shirts and just, I want to, you know what? I care about the people that love my music and I want to know who they are. You know, I'm, you know, when nothing makes my heart happier than when, you know, I, I get to sign an autograph or take a picture with um, like a mom and a dad. And then, you know, the, the, the adult child that they're bringing to a Lee Aaron concert. I'm going, when your music can transcend generations, that's a beautiful thing. We did a show uh, about five years ago, five, six years ago at the PNE here in Vancouver. The PNE is the Pacific National Exhibition. Right. And, um, you know, there was a guy, it, there was this family in front. It was like the granddad, the dad, who was in his 40s, and his daughter, who was about six, was on his shoulders. And I went, and they were just, they all came to the merch table and they were like, we all love your music. And I'm like, this it's just, this is why I do this. Right. Like I just yeah. love it. Right. That's amazing. Like, yeah. like there's not many people that can say that either, you know, obviously you've been in the business a long, a long time and you've kind of built a core audience that's followed you through your career and you know, your music, although it's kind of, it's, it's had quite a long journey, your, your music and it's taken different directions throughout this, throughout this time, the music that you're putting out now still, there's a lot of um, the original elements that you started out with. It's obviously progressed as you've, as you've grown. Not sure. But, um, <laughs> yeah, I should. But, um, but there's, still, there's still some common themes, which we'll touch on, on soon. But I think um, if people loved your music back then, then they're going to love what you're, what you're doing now, right? And they're going to hopefully, you know, it's, it's kind of classic rock and roll. And... Totally. That's, that spans the generations, right? I think so. You know, um, obviously my music has ebbed and flowed inter stylistically a little bit throughout the, the course of my career. Um, you know, when I was, you know, really, really young and full of piss and vinegar, it was, it was tougher sounding. Um, you know, and then I, I took a lot of, you know, I took some diversions. I went and I sang jazz for a while. Yeah. Um, at jazz and blues. Cause I love that music too. Um, I think, I mean, this is, this is the roots of rock and roll. I mean, for people, sure. yeah, people can, you know, they would go, Oh, you know, you've really changed. You're not doing rock. I'm like, what are you talking about? This is, this is Hendrix. This is where Zeppelin and these guys got it. Like yeah. Money Waters and Howlin' Wolf and, B.B. King, like this is where the roots of rock and roll, where it all came from. I feel like I felt like it was a history lesson for me, not only from an educational standpoint, from but from a musical standpoint, you know, to go back and actually sing and write and perform that style of music. Um, and I think that the music that I'm making nowadays embraces all of those uh, influences. And to me, you know, truthfully, like, there's not many artists that can keep making the same record over and over again every year and, and be great at it. There's a, there's a couple ACDC AC <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, like that's about it. Right. They keep making, or, you know, you know, you look at the German hard rock singer, Dora Pesch, she pretty much does stylistically the same thing, but you know, I love bands like Fleetwood Mac and, um, Bowie and even the Rolling Stones. I mean, come on, Miss You was a disco song, you know? Yeah. They, they have retained their sound, but definitely uh, had allowed modern music to influence their records along the way. And I look at myself that way because, you know, I'm still a fan. I'm a fan girl, right? Like I love, I love music. And, you know, when grunge was really popular, I was still in my late 20s. I loved it. I was like, why can't I take some of this and incorporate it into my own sound? I love this style of music. It was definitely authentic, right? And, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's definitely a, an element of just strong melody, classic rock and roll to what I do. And um, although I would like to think I'm writing songs with slightly more mature subject matter these days, because some of these artists that are you know, out there and it's like, okay, you know, you're like 50 
and you're still singing about drinking and chicks yeah. and like, hello, <laughs> like that doesn't, it, that's, I don't see how that's going to resonate with a fan that's grown up with you, whose worldview, obviously the most dramatic thing to shift your worldview is becoming a parent, right? Yeah. You know, you, all of a sudden you're all your priorities shift, right? You go, oh, that's important. It's not all about me, right? But that doesn't necessarily make for great rock and roll songs. Well. Doing the laundry and taking the kids to school. Can you make a song from that? <laughs> well, I wrote a song on the new album called Great Big Love. And it's kind of like, it's got almost like rock and roll gospel elements to the chorus of it. And I, I wrote it about how people that are complete opposites can attract, can still be attracted to each other and be the glue that keeps them together. And yeah, I wrote about some mundane things like, you know, you know, um, I'm not domestic, you're a pretty good cook, you know, like, <laughs> so, but it's, it's meant to be kind of tongue in cheek and funny, right? Yeah. So I think that if you do it in a tongue in cheek type of way, you can incorporate those things into your own rock and roll. There's a song on the new album called Wasted, um, which sounds like the ultimate rock and roll title, doesn't it? That's what I was going to say. But it's about addiction, about family, about exploring the history of your family addiction and confronting the person that wrecked your life. That's pretty heavy. But that's something yeah. that a lot of people our age can relate to because let's be honest, nobody has a functional family. Everybody has somebody in their extended family that suffered with alcoholism or some addiction of some sort, right? So I think it's a very relatable topic, but my modus operandi is how do I write this into a really relatable song that still has a rock and roll title? Yeah. You know? Well, it sounds like you did that, but I wanted to ask you a lot of your songs were to do with female empowerment. And, you know, there wasn't many people, especially back then that were singing about things like that. Considering what's happening, how do you feel about female empowerment now? And how is that still a part of your music? It's a theme that, creeps into every single one of my albums. In the very infancy of my career, when I was in my late teens, very early 20s, I went through a period of time where the uh, manager that I had at the time was, um, I think, you know, I don't harbor any ill will or feelings like that. I think he was just trying to get me out there and create as much of a stir and attention as he could. But you know, he, you know, also suggested, you know, you should be wearing these red spandex hot pants, you know, and I went through a very awkward stage of marketing where it was the emphasis was on, you know, being marketed like a pinup girl and, you know, go, I'd go to photo sessions and they were like, literally like taping my breasts together. So I looked like I had cleavage because I didn't, <laughs> you know, but yeah. And so I went through this really awkward period. So Metal Queen, the actual song was a real pushback. It, it was like, I'm taking my power back. This is about yeah. a, a female heroine, a powerful figure. It was supposed to be a feminist statement, but unfortunately, because it was the mid eighties and we were still, you know, creating music in this super sexist era mm. where all the guy bands had the, the female trophy models hanging off their arms and spraying them down with water and they were washing their cars and they, they all made them look more masculine. To a great degree, that, that message was misunderstood by yeah, some okay. people. However, I think the people today that still embrace and love that song, the, the feedback that I get really is that, yes, they did embrace it as an anthem of empowerment, personal empowerment. And I'm glad for that. And that's always what it's meant to have been. The song Some Girls Do was about not having to fit into the female stereotype box, being able to be, why can't I do just what a man does? and be accepted doing that. Why can't I wear the pants? That's what Some Girls Do was about. There's a song on like Diamond, Diamond Baby. The song Diamond Baby is about, you know, finding that diamond. You know, we're all diamonds in the rough. It's about embracing your diamond and taking back your power. Um, the song Vampin, there's a song called Vampin in, on the new album. And it's all, right. about, it's all about rising like a phoenix from a really difficult situation in your life and getting your groove back, right? I think because of that period of my life, which when you're young, you know, your things make such an imprint on you, right? 
And so be, as a result of that, I think it's a theme that keeps coming back for me again yeah. and again and again. Do you think things are heading in the right direction with, you know, especially with um, women in the rock music industry and uh, all, all of the music industry, really? Do you, can you see progress? It's, you know, it seems to be a slow progress, but can you see that? Well, I think, um, and I was, you know, I've talked about this a couple of times in a couple of other interviews that women, women like myself and Girl School and Joan Jett, Lita Ford, like the Runaways, you know, even pre my era, Joplin and Grace Slick and, you know, bands like Heart and Fleetwood Mac and all of like Stevie Nicks, women that were coming up in the 80s were really fighting hard against sexual stereotypes. It was there was a double standard where if you were attractive and you, you, you looked good, people went oh Well, she's just a pretty face that sings. And, you know, on my sixth album, which was released in 1991, um, I had always written my own songs. I'd always been involved in the production of my albums and my manager got a phone call. You know, I was in the office and he was explaining to somebody on the phone that yet, yeah, no, 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 she, no, Thank you. Thank you. Because Some Girls Do was a big hit in Canada. He was explaining that, no, she wrote that song. <laughs> it's like they were asking who wrote the hit for Lee because we're looking for songs for this girl. And I'm like, ah, really? I'm still fighting against this. So I think we opened up a lot of doors for artists like Avril Lavigne and Alanis and all... Courtney Love and Hole and The Breeder. I mean, all these 90s girls that could pick up guitars, write angry songs, and they had something to say. And suddenly they were all taken seriously. So you're the original riot girl. Yeah, well, I think so. <laughs> I'm still a little bit of a riot. <laughs> you know? Um, and so I think we opened up doors. But then there's always, with all of this woke culture now, it's almost like it's been turned on its head again, where women have taken it yet to people like Miley Cyrus are taking it to another level where they're going, I should be able to write songs about my poontang and be in your face about it. And you can't judge me. You think it's too much or you think it's. Well, for me, the jury is out. And again, I don't want to get myself in trouble because yes, we are in this woke culture. I'm all for female empowerment, but I don't think Miley Cyrus is who I want my 16 year old daughter modeling herself after. Are these the best role models mm. for our young women? I think about that because I'm a parent, right? Yeah. So it's almost like it's, it's almost gone over the edge of, you know, I can take my, I can do whatever I want, you know, and you're not allowed to judge me or say anything negative about me. Um, so I think it's really up to, you know, who do you want your, who do you want your kids to be role modeling mm -hmm. themselves after, right? Yeah. So you like, let's talk about the new, the new record, which is Radio One, exclamation mark. You talked about production briefly and you've worked with some amazing people in the studio over the years. And that seems to be continuing. Like, tell me a little bit about the actual putting together of this record really quickly. We wrote the songs in a weekend. We um, were a bi-coastal band. So Sean Kelly lives in Toronto. So we got them here because what happens is when my bandmates and I get in a room, magic happens. We know that about, and I've worked really long and hard to find the ultimate players. Like not only are they great players, they're great musicians, they're wonderful people, and they all have songwriting skills. So we got together in a, for a weekend and we literally came up with an album's worth of material. Then we started recording and I, I'm the producer. Um, I did, you know, in the end I ended up, refining the material that I wanted to go on to the album. We started recording the week the COVID, COVID exploded in March of last year. And we had to cut our four day recording bed track sessions down to two days. We recorded all the bed tracks literally in two days. So I'm happy about that because the energy, the spontane spontaneity of the tracks are there. And yeah. then we took it back home and we finished all the recording in home studios because um, that's the way we had to do it because of COVID. So the album was completed by the end of the summer last year. And then um, I sat on it for a, a couple of months because I was really trying to figure out, I knew the album was great and I wanted to work with a world-class mixer on it. 
And I interviewed, we and my manager interviewed a few different people and then I landed on Mike Fraser. And then I was like, okay, dude, this is the guy. Um, it was sort of like you talked when you talk to someone and you feel like you've known them your whole life. That was like, that's what it was like with Mike. And so I'm so happy with the final product of this album. I think it sounds brilliant. I think he I've, really got the soul of the Lee Aaron sound. So yeah, I've heard, I've heard the record um, and the sound is big and the, and the band sound incredible on it. Like, oh, you know, um, and obviously your voice has totally stood the test of time. And, you know, we, we touched on the fact that you did the jazz music and I know you've done a Christmas album as well. So you've, you've got a lot of variety within your uh, discography, but, and, but your voice always seems to perfectly fit to, to everything. If you, if you met somebody at a dinner party and they didn't know anything about you or your career, and they said, oh, what song should I listen to first? To what, is there a song that you would pick out? That kind from the of, new album? From the new album or anywhere throughout your career, just you know, to, to explain to somebody what you do. Well, that's interesting that you ask because I was, <laughs> I was standing in a long in McQuaid a couple of days ago picking up something that I ordered. And they all know me there. And one of the guys was being funny because he had just, one of the other employees had just discovered who I was and he went to Spotify and he put on what you do to my body. And I almost, it's weird because I can't, I play it all the time live, but I can't really connect to the subject matter as much anymore or the production values. I was listening in the store, I'm going, oh my gosh, this is, sounds so 80s, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. If I were to tell someone to listen to material, I'd probably pick something newer. I think I would pick a song like Diamond Baby because I think that it's tough, but it embraces that theme of empowerment that I'm, is a constant theme in my music. Plus it's got a bit of a bluesy edge to it um, and a bit of a soulful vibe to the vocal. So I'd pick either Diamond Baby or maybe a song like Vampin', Vampin' from the new album because I, again, I think that really encapsulate what Lee Aaron is all about. So my final question, I know you're a big movie fan. Yeah. And obviously you've had, you know, this extraordinary life. So in a movie about your life, who would play you? Who would you want to play you? Oh my, like a, a living actress? Well, hopefully. <laughs> I guess you could pick, you, you could pick living or dead, but who, who would you be like, oh yeah, they've cast this person in the role of Lee Aaron. I'm really happy with that. That's a really, I hate being put on the spot. In <laughs> Sorry. Um, who would play me? That's a tough question. Um, Helena Bonham Carter or Jennifer Jason Lee. <laughs> Somebody with some attitude, right? Yeah. For sure. Although I have been mistaken for Sandra Bullock before, which is really weird. <laughs> when she was here filming something, I was in a store and somebody was freaking out and I thought, oh my gosh, is this like personal year? And they thought I was Sandra Bullock. And I'm like, okay, well, that's a little bit of a lunch bag letdown for me. Hey, well, yeah, there is that, but it could, it could be a lot worse, right? Like, <laughs> I know. If you look back through your through your career so far, and you know you've got you're still putting out amazing music with brilliant musicians and working with great people in the studio, what is it kind of a moment from your from your life where you just still feel it's like a pinch me moment where, like, I can't believe that actually happened to me. Is there one that stands out? One time I was, I was in the late eighties. I think it was eighty-seven. I was um, at a some our friends. Last Tiger were opening up for Tina Turner on tour. Tina's amazing. Have you seen the Tina movie? So, oh no, I haven't yet. Yeah. Oh my gosh, it's, it's so much good. With... You got to see it. Okay. And I was a big Tina fan because you know she just she's she embodies rock and roll, right? Like that woman and. Um, so I'm at a, I was in that like roped off VIP area behind the sound console. And we were experiencing a lot of success in Europe at that time. And Chrissy Hine from the Pretenders was on a little bit of a hiatus because she had recently had her kids. So simul simultaneous to me realizing that Chrissy Hine was sitting like just in front of me in like a, with a hoodie and stuff. And I was almost, I was having like a, oh my God, that's, that's Chrissy Hines sitting in front of me. And of course I was like a huge fan. A bunch of kids realized it was Lee Aaron. So as I'm going, 
that's Chrissy Hind. A bunch of kids behind me are going, that's Lee Aaron. <laughs> I was going, and I wanted to go, you don't want my autograph. You, you want her <laughs> autograph, right? Like it was like, but then I realized she's probably really not going to appreciate that. So it was kind of like a, it was kind of a surreal moment for me to go. I don't feel like a star at all. That's the real star sitting in front of me, but you guys want my autograph. It was just, it was just like kind of a pinch me moment. And then in front of you both is Tina Turner. It's like Tina on stage, like killing it. Right. Yeah. It's just a weird moment. Thanks for your time, Lee. Take care.